Welcome to Roger That, a podcast presented by HVAF of Indiana. I'm your host, Lauren Carpenter, and join me as we discuss how HVAF is ending veteran homelessness and how you can join us in our mission. We'll be having conversations with community partners, staff members, and even some of the veterans we serve. We hope sharing more of our story with supporters like you can shine a light and give a voice to this vulnerable population, because no hero should ever be homeless. It's October, which means it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This month has always had a special place in my heart, as my grandma and my best friend's mom are both breast cancer survivors. According to the National Breast Cancer Foundation, one in eight women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. So chances are you know at least one person who has either been diagnosed or personally affected by breast cancer. But there is hope. The National Breast Cancer Foundation says when caught in its earliest localized stages, the five-year relative survival rate is 99%. Advances in early detection and treatment methods have significantly increased breast cancer survival rates in recent years, and there are currently over 3.8 million breast cancer survivors in the United States. And today on Roger That, you are going to hear from one of those 3.8 million survivors. Army veteran Nikki, who has received help from HVAF over the last several years, was diagnosed in 2021, but thankfully is now a survivor. You will also hear from Nikki's case manager, Sherelle, who helped Nikki during her battle and is still helping her with everything she needs today. Awareness of the facts and stats surrounding breast cancer is key in empowering individuals to make informed decisions about their health, which is why I wanted to share Nikki's story with you. I also hope Nikki's story can be an inspiration to you, whether you are currently battling cancer or just going through a challenging season of your life. And while we celebrate Nikki today, I know there are many who have sadly lost that battle. My heart goes out to those battling cancer right now and those who have lost loved ones to this awful disease. Here are my conversations with Army veteran and breast cancer survivor Nikki and her case manager, Sherelle. Hi, Nikki. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Well, thank you so much for coming on Roger That today and you know, sharing, sharing your story, um, you know, it's going to be some vulnerable parts. So we're, um, it's inspiring though. And we're really thankful that you're open to sharing your story with us. So we did talk a couple of years ago and I yes. was able to share your story on our, on our website and our blog. Um, but you know, I'd love to share it on our podcast and also it's been two years. So, you know, I'm sure a lot has happened since then that we'd like yes. to share. Yes. So first we'll take it all the way back to when you served um, first, what branch of the military did you serve in? The Army. Army, okay. And then did you like grow up always knowing you wanted to serve or was it something oh, you just no, kind of decided closer no. to it? No. I was uh, I was just in a mess. Mm-hmm. It just seemed like I was going nowhere. Was this right after high school? Um, no. I was in and out of jobs. I was waiting tables in bars it just seemed i was really i was downtown waiting jobs at a bar downtown and there was a recruiting office downtown and the MEP station was downtown you know and um there was some recruiters and i had passed by and a recruiter kept you know, why don't you, you know, join the military, you know? And I was like, seriously? You know, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. And just things just weren't rolling right in my life. It's, it, I didn't have, it's, I had family, but it just, things weren't, I wasn't stable. I didn't seem to have rootness. Mm-hmm. And I kept running into the same recruiter all the time when I was going to work or my shifts were changing and I'd pass by him on the street, walking to my car at the parking lot downtown off Meridian. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, 
you know what, you know, and he'd be with his other recruiting buddies, you know, coming in and out of the office at different times of the day when I was different shifts. You know what, we're still here. We ain't going, the office ain't going nowhere. I'm like, I'm just, you know, you're just trying to get me to come in there. (laughs) And one afternoon, I just was having a bad day, and Mm -hmm. I went in there. And he said, I knew I, what's going on. Sit down. You don't have to sign anything. Just tell me what's going on. And I was older. I was one of the older recruits that went in Mm -hmm. and I was underweight. You know, I was not even a hundred pounds. And he said, "I, I don't know, you know? And I said, well, See, I don't fit nowhere. Mm-hmm. And he said, just think about it, but you need to eat. And so a few weeks went by, and I really thought about it, so I started working out. I started eating, and I kept waiting tables downtown. He saw me, and he saw that I was gaining weight and stuff, and I went back in and signed the papers, and off I went and never looked back. Yeah. Where, um, how long did you serve and like, where did you go? What did you do all that? I was at Fort McCollum, Alabama. I did, I did about that time. Cause that was the eighties. I enlisted about 87, 86, about 85, maybe 85, 86, Fort McCollum, Alabama. And then my MOS, I was in public affairs, 25 Papa. So I got stationed out at Denver, out Denver, Colorado, Lowry Air Force Base, which was, uh, you know, all branches doing like what we're doing right here. Mm-hmm. You know, audio visual. So it was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I got hurt. And uh, I had some, I had a death in the family. So then I wound up uh, going National Guard. Mm -hmm. So I came back stateside because I had some family issues. And then I was out at Stoutfield. So I did the rest of my duty out at Stoutfield. Uh So then I got an honorable discharge and I did the rest of my turn. Southfield, so yeah how many years then all that was together four four okay so then once you got out what was life like for you that transition then out of the military back into civilian life mm. kind of different i i was more um organized more um I don't know. Um, I had more stability. I had more. I looked at things a lot differently. More organized. More. Nothing was chaotic. Nothing was foggy anymore. Mm-hmm. I had more organization. I had more. Things were more. Even when I transitioned into the National Guard. And had a job. I I wasn't a floating job. I I had restaurant. I went into restaurant. I went into cooking. Mm-hmm. I went into where I had more stability, mm-hmm. made more money. I looked for better better jobs, better where I had health benefits, where I had something. Not something that was going to float me by because I got caught up in the drinking. I got caught up in the partying. I Mm -hmm. got caught up in that kind of lifestyle. And the military kind of taught me, no, you you can't do that, Mm -hmm. you know. And so I'm thankful for that. Yeah. And it taught me how to survive because survival is the key 
and I can survive anything. Yeah, it definitely sounds like the military like changed your life and has shaped you into to who you are today. Oh, a fighter. Uh huh. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. It taught me that skills that I would have never have learned mm-hmm. if I wouldn't have listened. Mm-hmm. Oh, by far. Yeah. By far. If I never, if I never would have enlisted, I, I don't think I would have ever fought, s- learned to fought so hard through my cancer mm-hmm. journey. I think I would have given up on that and the homelessness and I, especially the homelessness because mm-hmm. when I was homeless. The, the skills the military taught me also helped me survive when I was homeless. Yeah. Just instinctively. Mm-hmm. Because of the skills I learned through the military. Yeah. Let's um let's kind of get more into that then. And like, so we'll fast forward then um, to when, when, what year was that? And kind of how, how did you find yourself homeless? Um. <clears throat> Tail end of COVID. Okay. Um, you know, everything during COVID got so crazy. Mm-hmm. So crazy. Especially probably being the restaurant industry. Right. And I was a cook. Mm-hmm. And I was making good money. I worked at Bob Evans. And I made great money. Mm-hmm. And I lived in an apartment. Mm-hmm. Well, by myself. And so when COVID hit, restaurants, especially the food industry, took a hit like no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So all companies just, they had to let their people go. Mm -hmm. And so my company tried very very hard especially my restaurant really tried to hold on to as many employees as they possibly could Mm -hmm. we had to shut everything down Mm -hmm. and so we you know i'll never forget it we closed the whole dining room down all our wait staff left you know we only kept the takeout part open Mm -hmm. you know we could only let so many people come in right order take out and it it was just awful so my gm he kept as many food staff people as he could to make takeout orders and he would work us like 12 hours a day just to keep us on staff to keep us because he was trying to help us keep our homes and stuff and he was trying to rotate us, and it was just getting to terrible. And we couldn't, you know, grocery stores were shutting down, and it was just terrible. Mm-hmm. I had a car payment, car insurance, rent, you know, couldn't make ends meet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you had to share the hours with what people, and it just wasn't working. Mm-hmm. and I couldn't make the bills. And the only thing I could make was my car payment and car insurance was what was getting down and food mm-hmm. and my cell phone. And my mom dies from cancer, mm-hmm. and I'm having to help take care of my mom. And because my half-brother and half-sister, they're having their problems, and they're trying to help take care of my mom. Mm -hmm. She passes away with cancer. My half-sister helps bury my mother with cancer. My two dogs, I have two dogs, they wind up having cancer. Mm. I have to put them down because I can't afford their medical bills. So I'm hit. With the tail end of COVID, all this stuff, I'm struggling with bills. My mother passes away with cancer. I've got two dogs passing away with cancer. 
I'm losing my apartment. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I'm losing my apartment. Now I'm homeless. Mm-hmm. So then, my boss allows me to stay in my car in the parking lot. And there's a grocery store across our parking lot. I thank God for the military. He taught me how to survive. I'd take blankets all the way around my car. I'd sleep there at night. It was freezing cold. I'll oh, never yeah. forget this time. Yeah. It's freezing cold. And I'm taking, I'd open it, buy tubs, you know, jugs of water to wash my hair, and I'd wash up and stuff. And I'd run to the grocery store to before they closed to go use the bathroom, and I'd brush my teeth. And a um, uh, worker would let me go to her house on my days off to go do laundry, mm-hmm. and then I'd work as many hours as I could work just to keep, you know, money in my bank account. And I had a friend on Facebook. And he said, Nikki, do you have an honorable discharge? I went to high school and grew up with him. And he knew I was in the military. And I said, yeah. And he said, really? He said, I was in your same predicament. And this group helped me out. I think you need to give them a call. He said, my case manager, he gave her name and this phone number. And he said, I do believe she'll help you. I said, and here I'm in the car. And and I was on my day off. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was snowing. It was like almost 30, you know, below zero here. Mm -hmm. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Because I had called so many other places and, you know, they mm-hmm. were booked because it was so cold here, you know, mm-hmm. Indiana weather. And I called and she said, I can get you, if you can get your, your papers. And they were in storage. She said, by 4 p.m. today, I can help you. Where do you want to meet? And she said, call me back if you can get your papers. And I flew to the storage unit. I knew exactly where my papers were. Mm-hmm. And I sh- called her back, told her I had my papers, and showed them to her. And she got me in a motel. And then I had already been to the doctor because I had found my lump. Mm-hmm. And I already had a biopsy. I was in the motel three days and then was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. I was like, really? You gonna kick me when I'm running? Right. Yeah. yeah. So then that leads to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was after you had come to HVAF and then you found out that you had breast cancer. Right. I was three days into the motel. What was when you found out, yeah, what was going through your head? Yeah. Then I, I, you know, here I'm three days in the motel, and then I'm thinking, you know, I, I got settled into the motel, and I'm thinking, all right, now, now, here I go. I, I'm, I, I'm thinking I got, I've got my foot on the ground. Mm-hmm. I, I'm gonna get going, and then I'm driving down the road, going to work, and my, I pull into work, and my doctor i pull in the parking lot to go, get ready to go into work mm-hmm. and my doctor calls me she says nikki are you driving and i said i just pulled in at work she says turn your car off are you are you in the parking lot and i said yes she said turn your car off mm-hmm. i go this isn't good is right. it she says no you have breast cancer I need to see you. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. She said no. 
what happened after that then? So then uh, we made an appointment. I went in there, and then she uh, referred me to the breast center at St. Francis Hospital. And I went in and saw the breast specialist, the surgeon, and she said I had, I was in stage two, point five. It was caused by estrogen. And um, I said, I, I, I was like in a fog because it just seemed like, I don't know. Hard to believe. In the process, I was just yeah. like, this is so surreal. Mm-hmm. It just can't. I just thought it was like a cyst. Mm-hmm. It something minor just go away, right? And she said it was because um, I had already had a hysterectomy many many years ago, and she said it was from being on birth control pill for so many years. And it was due to that. Thank God I was very well endowed. And it was only in one breast that I had an option. That I caught it early enough. Mm -hmm. I found my lump. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it early enough. I had to have three surgeries. The first surgery, they didn't get it all. Mm -hmm. So the next week... They got it out of three margins, and so the next week they had to reopen me back up and get it out of the rest of the six margins. And then um, after that, they went in my good breasts, and I said, take me down, because I was really big. To take me down to a B cup, take all of it out of the left, and they reconstructed my right one and took me way down to a B cup. And then I've been cancer free for almost, it'll be three, almost three years. But they reconstructed me using my own tissue. Mm-hmm. So. That and then I had to go, I, and then I bled out, and then I had to have a blood transfusion, and then I went through 13 weeks of chemotherapy, mm-hmm. five weeks of radiation every single day, except Saturday and Sunday, had blisters after radiation, which is no picnic. Mm-mm. And then I was done, and then I've had, uh, due to the chemo, I lost all my teeth, had to have uh, dentures, and then uh, I've had some heart problems, and so um, next week I have to have a pulmonary heart sleep study done. I'll be in the hospital for two days. Um, and there's some um, other, I've had to have an MRI to make sure the cancer didn't go up to my head like it did my mother. Mm-hmm. That came out great, so that's mm-hmm. good. I have to have a colonoscopy to make sure the cancer hasn't gone south like it did my mother. Um, I've got... Uh, the chemo has ate up my um, the bone density in my hip, in my right hip, and in the bone scans. So I have to um, next month go to my doctor and I have to be uh, referred to an orthopedic 
a surgeon. I have to have injections put into my lower spine and into my right hip um, because of the loss of bone density due to the chemotherapy because I was so older Mm -hmm. when I was placed on the chemo that it deplenished part of the density of the 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 bone Mm -hmm. because I was put on the red devil for six weeks and the red devil in chemo is as red as the part of the flag it's in a bag about this big and it's red and it makes you very very sick so you know that was part of my journey and yeah yeah it um you know I've, I've been through anything like that so for me I'm thinking okay you have cancer you go through chemo radiation and then you're either done or you have to keep going and so I just have never thought about all the different effects that you can still have, even, you know, you've been cancer free for almost three years and you still have to deal with yeah, all these things. Yeah, there's still, cause you get, and then that's like my memory. Mm-hmm. My memory is not as good as it used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still numb from uh, the chemo. Mm-hmm. You lose feeling like the, my fingertips. I can't get like change. Like if you put like got reach in your pocket, and you put change down on the table. I can't, like you, you can go and pick it up. Mm-hmm. I can't do that no longer. Mm-hmm. I have to take my hand and I have to go like this. Mm-hmm. I I have no feeling in my fingertips. You can, I can go like this and you can stab me with a, a knife and... What knife? So I've had to, like my uh, oncologist, I still see my oncologist. I'm on a five-year pill to keep me from producing estrogen. Even though I've had a hysterectomy, I have a little bit of an ovary left. Mm -hmm. But your brain in a female, I don't know. He tried to explain it to me. I don't know all the technology. But it keeps me from producing that because my cancer is caused from estrogen. Okay. So it kind of keeps me from doing that because if I do, I will get cancer again. Mm -hmm. So I'm on this five-year pill, and after five years, I don't have to take it anymore. So... I kind of got sidetracked there, but um, I don't remember things very well. And that's another side effect. And then the chemo, it it just, and then they took out limb nodes. Mm -hmm. And they take out, and I've got a scar over here. Well, I can't have blood taken out of this arm for seven years. I can't have my blood pressure taken out of this arm for seven years my arm swells because of that my hand swells because of that sometimes I can't hold a pen because it swells I have to wear a glove and a and a sleeve Mm -hmm. I've got a pump at home that I got to put on and on this leg and run for an hour when it does swell and lay there for an hour while it kind of does this and on my leg for an hour because of the lymph nodes they took out. And the lymph nodes, why they take out the lymph nodes and test the lymph nodes is to see if the cancer has traveled anywhere else throughout the body. Mm-hmm. At that time, it, it hadn't because the cancer, they caught it early enough. Mm-hmm. And I was lucky that they caught I caught it because it floated Mm -hmm. because I was so big. Mm -hmm. But thank God I caught it. Mm -hmm. How do you, after so many years now, how do you just keep remaining a fighter and staying positive through all of this? Because I'm scared. Yeah. 
I don't want to ever go through that again. Mm-hmm. And in the, the back of my mind, because you hear stories, old stories, because I, I'm 60. I'm going to be 61 this year. And I always heard growing up, once you have cancer, that's what you're going to die of. Mm-hmm. I used to hear stories that once they cut you open, if you've got cancer, it spreads like wildfire, and that's what you're going to die of. You're going to find it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So in the back of my mind, I'm scared to death. That's eventually what I'm going to die of. Mm-hmm. And my chemo was so harsh, I told my oncologist, because I still have to see him. Mm -hmm. I have to see him. And me and him, I I told him. I've yelled at him. I've been so sick. I've, uh, he's the one that made me give my car away, give it back, because I drove there. And I was so gray. I needed a blood transfusion. He said, he had to put me in a wheelchair. He said, how'd you get here? I said, I drove. He said, what? Because they they put a port in your chest, and that's how they administer your chemo and Mm -hmm. draw your blood, because you only got one good vein over here. They got to put a port in your chest. He said, how'd you get here? I said, I drove. He said, you need a blood transfusion. I'm admitting you. I said, you ain't admitting me. Because I knew once they admitted me, I wasn't getting out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that was my patient right. They plastered all over the hospital. You ain't admitting me. Because I was already in in the motel. Mm -hmm. You ain't admitting me. So I made him call my son to come and get me. And I drove back to the motel. I had my son follow me. Mm Mm-hmm. My son was uh, thinking I'm crazy. <laughs> so no, you. And then I made him give me a blood transfusion. I had my son follow me back to the motel, and I promised my oncologist I would call Ray Skillman back up and hand him the keys to my car. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. Yeah. So, and that's what I did. I and my son thought I was crazy. My oncologist thought I was crazy. He said. You drove here? Are you nuts? Yeah. And, but I would never do, I, I told him I would never do chemo again. Mm-hmm. That's how bad chemo was to me. Mm-hmm. I remember crawling on the floor in a, in a motel just to get to the bathroom. And I mean, they give you medication to keep you from getting sick at both ends. Mm-hmm. Hate to be that, but yeah. it, it, it's pretty rough. And I I don't know, and that that scares me mm-hmm. to hear that again. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's understandable. So during this time, you know, you're you're in the motel, you're getting help from HVAF. So. How, how did HVF and your case manager, Sherelle, help you during that time? Oh, Sherelle was, oh, Godson. Oh, my God. Once I got Sherelle as a case manager, everything, it was, everything lightened up. Mm-hmm. It, it just seemed like all my doors opened up. I got help. It, it, it was like she she gave me a list of phone numbers. It, it was like then I got, I had numbers to call. Then I had um, this one number that I called that they would brought me a box each week that had, because in the motel they had those little refrigerators and they would bring me frozen meals. Mm. So then I had frozen meals that I could put in the refrigerator. And they they knew I had cancer because I would tell them, you know, mm-hmm. they asked, you know, series of questions, you know. Yeah. So they would come to the motel and bring me meals. So then I had meals. 
Then there was another number that I called. Then it directed me to the American Cancer Society. Within the American Cancer Society, instead of calling Medicaid, because I had to give my car away, because mm-hmm. the oncologist had already said, you ain't driving no more. <laughs> you lost your mind. So I had to give my car away. So Sherelle had hooked me up with this other number. I called that number, and they hooked me up with the American Cancer Society. So the American Cancer Society would pick me up for free, take me to my chemo appointments, my radiation, and they'd sit in the waiting room for you. Oh, or crochet or do whatever they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But they wait in the waiting room for you till you're done with your appointment and then they bring you back, you know? So that was taken care of. Mm-hmm. She had hooked me up with, I mean, a nurse navigator at the hospital. I mean, it was just one help after another. So it was like so much weight was lifted off. I didn't have to worry about mm-hmm. all that anymore. And then it just seemed like, then she hooked me up with, um, oh, I have to look her up in my phone. She hooked me up with the one little girl here that handles all the medical stuff, Mm -hmm. disability and uh, the, you know, the medical stuff. She hooked me up with her. She, you know, then she got all my my medical situations figured out because, you know, they were asking me stuff at the hospital and, you know, to figure out the bills and all that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just, it seemed like everything started falling into place. I, where it was so chaotic and I didn't know what, how I was going to handle everything, you know, and my medicine, you know, cause I was get I had, I, I'm down to like 10 pills, uh, about eight medications now where I was at 18 medications a day I was taking. And that wasn't, you know, the stuff they were sticking on me here and stuff I had in my chest and IVs and on top of that every day. Mm -hmm. So everything was falling into place. And it was like a godsend. And then... um, as things started getting organized, I started getting out of the motel. Then, you know, I had all my stuff in storage and, you know, and then my disability was kicking in and then, you know, and then I got my apartment and then I started, you know, really getting on my feet. And, you know, just, she's helped me out a lot. Just, mm-hmm. you know, being there and help guiding me into, you know, getting back to where I was before all this, Mm -hmm. you know, before the boulder got. Yeah. That's something that I do think is really, excuse me, something that I think is really cool about our programs as if, you know, our case managers like can't directly help you. They have the resources to point you in the right direction. Work the program. Mm -hmm. The program works if you work the program the resources are there for you Mm -hmm. just work it it's not that hard Mm -hmm. call the numbers the resources are there and if you if the resource can't help you they've got another resource for you Mm -hmm. yeah you know it's a network Mm -hmm. and that's all i did and even before um, Sherelle, there was a number or two that Emily even gave me mm-hmm. that I called. And then the nurse navigator yeah, at St. Francis Hospital. I mean, she had a couple numbers I called. And then it was like... Um, like even the American Cancer Society... It's like a, kind of like a pyramid or kind of like a, a family tree. Mm-hmm. Like Sherelle was, is the tree, and it's just the branches. Mm-hmm. And if you just work that, 
you know, like you guys are the, and it just works. Mm -hmm. That's like, I'd do anything in the world for any of you guys here. All you got to do is ask because Mm -hmm. you've given me my life. I'd be dead without you guys, all of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you gave me Christmas that one year. I mean, you've all helped me so much. I I seriously would be dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's amazing the timing when you found us. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I believe that. Yeah. I know before you had said that um, Cheryl would check in on you a lot during that time. Oh, yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you all right? Yeah, she called me. Mm-hmm. You okay? Oh, yeah. I'd be sicker than a dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you okay? If I wouldn't pick up the phone, she'd text me. Or she'd call me. You all right? Mm-hmm. And, you know. What does that mean to have that, just even just oh. like moral support like that? That meant the world to me because I had nobody. Mm -hmm. I had nobody. My mom was, and my son, I mean, he was, my son's father passed away when he was eight. Mm -hmm. And he has no people on his dad's side. They're all dead and gone. Mm -hmm. And then my mom's gone. Mm -hmm. My other siblings were not real close. And so all he has is me. So when he found out, I had cancer and all this is going on. This was just like Mm -hmm. his mind, you know? So he, and then in a motel and, and then I'm having problems and he was just overwhelmed himself. So he didn't quite know what to do. Mm -hmm. So it was so nice. I was so alone. Mm-hmm. It was so nice to know I had somebody. And I, I wish I could have thanked the guy that led me to you guys mm-hmm. and find him again. Because if it wasn't for him giving me that one phone number. Right. It, you know? Yeah. And I don't know what ever happened to him. Oh, okay. Maybe he'll be listening. <laughs> we oh, can. I hope so. I hope so. Because yeah. that one phone number. Mm-hmm. And if I could help just one person like he helped me. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge way I know that veterans find us is word of mouth through other veterans. So right. that's great. Yeah. Because it just took that one person. Mm-hmm. Because he told me, he said, yeah, I was I was living downtown. And he said, one veteran on the street passed by him. He was on the street, too. And he said, gave him the mm-hmm. phone number. And he said, so I, I'm returning the favor and giving you the number. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So... Since you've been in remission, it's been a few years now, how has HVF and Sherelle continued to help you since then? Oh, she don't check up on me as much as she used to. <laughs> but I think that's because she knows I, I'm i I'm strong now. Mm-hmm. I'm doing good. Um, and she's proud of me. I know she is. And... um. I'm going to cry when she lets me go. And, but, oh, I'm getting teary <laughs> Um, But, um, I think she'll still check on me from time to time. And I'm going to call her every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Let yeah. her know how I'm doing. Right. But, um, all in all, you know, she, she let me know. She says she's going to check on me every month. This next few months, because in uh, in March, I'm on my own. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. You got a little time left. <laughs> I got a little time left. 
Yeah. But I think, oh, no, she's she's real proud of me because it's been, it's been a journey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, but I've done it. I've done everything she's asked. The only thing, I haven't got a car. I'm still kind of wanting to get a car, mm-hmm. but I'm kind of holding off because where I'm at now, I'm in a senior community, and I'm real close to everything, and all my needs are met. Uh, I'm financially good now. Um, we've got uh, a like a, they've got like a senior bus there that, I mean, it'll take you pretty much anywhere you want to go. Mm-hmm. And um, there's um, activities and my son now really helps me out too now. We're kind of, you know, things are going really good between us That's now, great. which is really good. Mm-hmm. And so, you know. A car is kind of like, well, if it happens, it happens. If it don't, it don't, you mm-hmm. know. I'm good. Yeah. You know, so, you know, but I, I've reached all my goals that I've set out for myself when I didn't have nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm proud that I've reached those goals that I set with her. Mm-hmm. That, that makes me feel really good. Oh, yeah, should. You know, yeah. because... When me and Sherelle first met, I mean, she was tough with me. She was like, you know, this is what we got to do. Mm-hmm. And this is what you got to do. You got to put the work into this, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and hold your hand. Yeah. You know, this is what I expect. And I'm proud I've done that, too. Yeah. You know, I not only fought cancer but i i work this program Mm -hmm. and i believe that if you're going to be a part of this program you got you got to put the work to yeah you know you can't just let these people hold your hand and say i'm gonna do this for you now Mm -hmm. you know here's these numbers but i'll make the calls for you no it don't work that Mm -hmm. way nah Mm mm-hmm while you sit over here and, you know, think, you know, it's going to fall from the sky. Right. It's not going to do that. It, right. it, the world don't work that way. hmm You know? Yeah. These people, it's, see, that's why, I, and I get a little upset when I see people stand, I, I may not shouldn't say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say this. I get upset when I see people standing on the street holding a sign because there's too many places out here in this world that will help you. Mm -hmm. There's too many jobs out there. You may not have a cell phone, but there is a door you can walk into there is always a table somewhere that someone will hand you a cell phone and let you call what's that number, 288-988-whatever. I've even called that number and gotten assistance. Mm-hmm. I got energy assistance on my electric bill. I did that. Mm-hmm. I didn't call Sherelle to do that for me. I did that on my own. Mm -hmm. Get up off the corner. I was living in a car in the middle of winter, 20 below zero. You can make a phone call. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be standing. You don't need to be sitting. You can make a phone call. Mm Mm-hmm. You can get help. There are places, and even if a shelter is full, even if a place is full, there's too many resources in the world today that can help you. Mm -hmm. Because they have networks. They have... Yeah. 
So, yeah. Yeah. If there's someone listening who maybe they just found out they have cancer or a loved one has cancer or just, you know, something difficult like that that they're going through, what would you like to say to them for, you know, encouragement and to be a fighter like yourself? Don't be afraid to cry. Don't be afraid to scream. Don't be um, it's okay to be overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to ask, why me? Mm -hmm. And to have all those feelings. And it's okay, um, the people around you are not going to understand Mm -hmm. your feelings. And they're going to be trying to be comforting and they're they're going to try to reach out and they're not going to understand how you feel. Yeah. And just hold on. Um and when you're the sickest as you think you can just be and you're at your weakest. Don't give up. Just if nothing else, just take your spirit and reach. Just reach your hand up as high as it. you think it, you can reach your hand. Mm-hmm. And something, someone, whether you're religious, you're not religious, but just reach your hand for, to the sky and someone will grab it. Mm-hmm. Something will grab it. And that strength will hold you tight and hold your hand and get you through it. And just hold on to what's ever holding on to your hand. And that will get you through that chemo ride, that radiation ride, that burn. Mm -hmm. My radiation burns didn't come out till after my radiation stopped. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's a burn like no other burn you'll ever feel. And the blisters, just ride it out. Mm -hmm. And just, just the chemo sickness, just, just hold on. Mm -hmm. And just, if you're a faith believer, just pray to get through the ride. And if you're not a faith believer, because some people aren't, they don't believe in God, just hold that strength inside you. Mm -hmm. And just, I used to count the weeks. And I used to ask the nurse, what week are we on? Because each week your brain gets a little more foggier and foggier. You kind of the weeks kind of roll together and you kind of forget, God, what week am I on? How many more weeks of this do I got? You know, mm-hmm. so getting so sicker and sicker. Each week you get chemo, you get sicker and sicker. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what week am I on? How many more weeks have I got of this? And just think to yourself, that's one less week I've got to go through. Mm-hmm. If I make it through this, I'll make it through another week, you know. And don't think of, I used to think at the beginning, God, am I going to make it through this? Is this really going to kill me? Mm -hmm. Don't think like that. Think that, yeah, okay, that's one less more I've got to take. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it through this. This is not going to kill me. This is not going to kill me. Because chemo sometimes kills people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people can't make it through chemo. Mm -hmm. Because it is a poison. 
Because they are putting poison in your body. Mm-hmm. And some people can't make it through. They just think, you're not going to kill me. Mm-hmm. They took the cancer out of my body. I'll be damned if you're going to kill me. Mm-hmm. And that's how I looked at it. Especially when they put the red devil in me. When mm-hmm. they told me that's what it was. Yeah. And they said not too many people get the red devil. Mm-hmm. And at the cancer center, they uh, the pharmacy is like in the basement. And the nurses, they, they go to the side and then they put the prescription or whatever. They compute it in and it shoots up from the floor. And then they come over to you. And it even has a radioactive, like, stamp on it and stuff like that. And you're like, whoa, yeah. okay. And you're putting that in my body. Mm-hmm. Really now? Okay. And then, you know, after the first week when I went like this to my hair and then mm-hmm. I got a handful of hair. And then that's when I had them shave my head at a girl from work, I had her shave my head. She was a beautician. She had some shears in her car, and I said, just shave it. Yeah. And I just went bald. I didn't wear wigs. I didn't. And then when I went like this, the third third week, and my eyebrow was mm-hmm. in my hand, and I lost my eyelashes. But it all grows back, mm-hmm. you know. I went around, I went bald. Bald is beautiful. Mm-hmm. I didn't wear no wig or anything like that. But it all grows back. Mm-hmm. Grows back a little bit different than what it was. But, you know, just, you got to fight through that chemo and just, you know. And then afterwards, I mean, it's all good and everything now, but I... You just always have that scare. And, like, my first mammogram after, that's the scariest Mm -hmm. that anybody faces. Because you go in there after your first first mammogram, after your cancer, and after you're done. That's when I was the scariest. Mm -hmm. Because you're like, oh, God. Is it really gone? Mm -hmm. And I almost passed out. Yeah. Because I was like, uh, because they tell you the results right there. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't play around with you. They, it's a, it's a whole different mammogram like you've ever had before. It's the same mammogram, but they treat you completely different. They take you in, they do it, they put you in a different room than like going in like a mammogram, like you go in with everybody else and, you know, you sit with the other ladies and they, oh, you know, your doctor will be back with you. you know, mm-hmm. like, no, they don't do that. Yeah. They take you, they put you in a separate room and then they come right out and they tell you what the results are. I, was ne- I never sweated so much in my life. Yeah. And in the, to this day, I have to go every six months. Okay. And I meet with my surgeon. Mm-hmm. It's not like I, I, I go, I get the mammogram, and I go directly to the surgeon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we wouldn't be able to help you during that time and and continue to without, you know, our supporters, you know, people who are listening and just our donors and all that. So what would you like to say to them that, you know, because they've donated to us so then we can help you? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, the, all the things that they have done for me and donated to me. I appreciate you guys. You, uh, Cause I, I didn't have anything cause I, I like, um, I sold as much stuff as I could to try to keep my apartments and mm-hmm. I sold my furniture and all that stuff. And, you know, and so when I moved into my 
apartment, you know, I got furniture and all that. I appreciate it. It's beautiful. I love it. Um, so thank you so much for all the help, the donations. And the, like I said earlier, I don't know if we were on or anything, but like my first Christmas, mm-hmm. um, my, I think I was in the radiation. I was out of chemo, but, um, I had just moved into my apartment and I didn't have, uh, Sherelle asked me if I wanted anything and all I wanted was like some household goods, mm-hmm. you know, like laundry detergent, stuff like that. And they gave me like laundry detergent and soap and shampoo and stuff like that. Oh, I appreciate it. I used that. That helped me out so much. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I appreciate all that. So, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And canned goods and stuff like that. When I was in transition from mm-hmm. chemo and radiation and just moved, I appreciate it all that thank you yeah i'm so glad we could help you and um and continue to so thank you so much for for coming on here today oh you're welcome and sharing your story with us oh thank you i I just uh, so glad to just thank you so much Mm -hmm. so how long have you been at hvaf since 2021 early um 2021 Somewhere around that time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what is your role here? I am a rapid rehousing case manager at Fast Pace Housing okay. for our clients. Okay. And so what is like your day to day then look like? Like what are some of your role like roles and responsibilities here? Um, most of my day is working with clients. Um, whether I have a new client to enroll or um just working with some of my clients that are already on my caseload. No more than about 20, 21 at the most okay. clients at any given time. Um, and, and when I stay working with them, that's helping them achieve their goals or searching for housing or, um, you know, bill payment requests or employment requests or just helping them get to appointments. Or mm-hmm. it might be a, a variety of different things that I could be possibly be assisting those those veterans with. Mm-hmm. And why would you say that you like working here at HVAF and, and like serving veterans and, and, and more specifically? So first off, I have to say that I am um, my, my father mm-hmm. as well as my stepfather. We're both Marines, mm-hmm. um, veterans. Uh, so I've always had an interest in, in those who served our country. Yeah. Um, but working here at HVAF, the resources are available to help those who did serve our country. Mm-hmm. Um, and that pleases me to be able to assist them, to be able to um, network with a variety of different agencies and organizations and federal government programs to be able to provide the needs of these individuals who may be in need that served for our country. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And especially because I know to a lot of veterans, they don't even know that yeah. these resources are out there. So I'm sure that's a great feeling to know exactly. that you can just, just even connecting them with those is probably great to, exactly. to be able to do. Yeah. So when you first got connected with Nikki, um, what, what was all going on and how did you help her? Um, so Nikki was enrolled under a different case manager um, because of her case and her situation. She was enrolled by met one of the management staff. Mm-hmm. And um, once they kind of figured out everything that was going on, they placed her, handed her over to me as a case manager. And when I first got her file, I was like, oh, wow. You know, this is special. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to treat it with care. Not that you don't treat each and every veteran with care, but the aspect that this individual was homeless um, as soon as placement into a hotel, which is still considered displacement, Mm -hmm. still considered Mm -hmm. homeless. Um, Then to find out that she has breast cancer and the things that come with being diagnosed with breast cancer, chemo, radiation, surgery and the thoughts alone you know um, and her still being homeless Mm -hmm. without income um, without some of her basic needs when I got the the case it's just I had to start just compacting compiling resources Mm -hmm. thinking about what are the things that can help her Um, of course she had her day-to-day with doctor's appointments and and different things like that Um, but from the case manager's 
point of view, it's like I, you have to figure out every single thing that could possibly uplift, encourage this veteran in mm-hmm. the current state that they're in right now. So mm-hmm. it was sort of like a a race, you know. Um, again, it was until in a COVID, you know, um, housing resources and, and um, things were just ev- from everyone who lost ho- housing and homes and you know, things were a little scarce and you just had to, to pull the tricks out of bags to right. be able to provide mm-hmm. the resources that, that she needed at the time. So, yeah, and then not move too fast for what was going on with her and her health, mm-hmm. you know, being considerate and taking that into account. You know, is it time to move into a home? Should we right. move her out of a hotel at this time? Mm-hmm. Should we move her in there's no income we should so we need to seek out housing vouchers and Mm -hmm. it was just a lot of collaboration and and HVAF me as her case manager yes my she had direct contact with me Mm -hmm. but here at HVAF you know we work together Mm -hmm. as a team to pull resources out of a bag yeah she may have seen them coming off for me yeah (laughs) you know but yeah we work together to get that plan yeah, what did it mean to you to be able to help her during such a difficult time in her life? Actually, it was it was actually an honor. Again, mm-hmm. it's an honor to be able to assist an individual who has served our country yeah. in need of assistance and still, you know. Um, so to be able to be there for her, to see everything transpire, to watch from the beginning to the end, mm-hmm. it always brings me to tears. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to hold back tears when I think about her story with yeah. HVAF mm-hmm. and HVAF's role within her story. Yeah. You know? So, and it's a, it's been an honor. Yeah, and, um, you know, how, how have you been able to continue to help her even, like, once she was in remission and all that? Mm-hmm. So, once... Nikki went into remission. Um, it was a time then to, I believe, uh, begin the stability planning mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of everything and, and to kind of pull that out of her um, to focus on that. Uh, so more so in, in providing financial assistance or support for her housing. Um, as far as rent, um, we began to allow her to pay a certain percentage while the SSVF grant would pay a certain percentage. We Mm -hmm. would set goals, uh, you know, Nikki originally, and then we would reconsider goals uh, such as a vehicle and, you know, and then saying, no, that's not needed. And then funds to be saved. You know, we worked on savings and, you know, rebuilding relationships um, with our son and Mm -hmm. different things like that. Uh, the stability goes, so it, again, HVF is a housing first program. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we want to get them into housing. But to make sure that they have all the tools that they need to be stable once HVAF is not there anymore mm-hmm. it is what we wanted to focus on. So that's where Nikki and I have been for since um, – she has been cancer free. We have mm-hmm. been working on all those goals and I see it. Nikki is strong and mm-hmm. Nikki is resilient and mm-hmm. self-sufficient and goal oriented. And I've never seen anybody as strong as she has been through this whole ordeal. Yeah. And um, even though we don't like to see the relationships come to an end, especially one that has lasted this length of time, I know she's ready. Mm -hmm. she's ready yeah yeah so what are then some of those next steps so um nikki in regards to the exit of the program next steps are monthly i'm talking to her monthly um just checking and making sure that you know financially she's good on her end i mean there has been some hit one hiccup where and not anything of her fault um she uh her her account was compromised so being able to still be there and Mm -hmm. provide the financial support during that period but she did never needed any extra financial support even during that period of when you know uh, her account was compromised and and funds weren't 
as they should have been. Um, and she bounced back. So, so working our way as far as discharging is what we, we call it. Mm-hmm. Working towards a discharge, I'll continue to call Nikki monthly, check on her finances, her relationships, see if there's any other goals, any other resources in the community that she might need. And during these last months, there it would seem that there is nothing that she needs and that's what we want to see. Mm-hmm. Because if we did our job uh-huh. moving towards this discharge, right. that's what it's supposed to be. So, but it's just a follow up. Um, we'll continue to cheat, make sure that she's, you know, collaborates well with her property managers and, and all of those things are turned over to her and which they have already put into place and she's already doing those things. We'll just make sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for those listening, you know, why would you say, as based on your experience of the veterans that you've served like here, why would you say they should support HVAF and veterans like Nikki? I would tell anybody to donate to HVAF. Mm-hmm. Um, I whispered that, but I'm going to say it loud. I would tell <laughs> everybody to donate to HVAF. Um, I'll start from just, I've never worked for an agency where all team members, and I'm speaking employees, I call it, you know, we call them employees, but we're the team, mm-hmm. work so hard and so compassionate about the the veterans we serve, the group of people that we serve. Mm-hmm. Um, we not only donate to HVF, we, we provide um, resources to our veterans in regards to uh, handicap accessible items that have been donated to us, you know, uh, power wheelchairs and wheelchairs. Um, you should see some of our veterans who had no way or no resource to get those and how happy they are to mm-hmm. receive those things and, Donate to our food pantry, yeah. um, you know, our uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. Our, I mean, the lines and the people are happy. It's not just the food, the clothing, and the household items that they're able to get that they may not have been able to to purchase because most are on a fixed income mm-hmm. or are homeless or waiting for housing, displaced at the time. And then, you know, um, just, just, just the annual fund. We put on barbecues for our veterans to show them that we we appreciate them we we do community things for the children and families uh the families who have children Mm -hmm. you know um so donating to hvaf is not donating to an agency is donating to the well-being of a veteran who served for our country Mm-hmm. who enlisted to serve for our country, no matter what service that was. Um, we are here. We're uplifting them. Um, the funds are all pushed out, you know, to the veterans, you know, for Christmas. Christmas, we we help hundreds of families, and not just families with children, mm-hmm. individual adult veterans without children in the household. So, so please donate to HVAF, mm-hmm. continue to donate to HVAF. Yes, there are federal funds for, um, housing stability, but the other needs that they may have come f- and we supply those needs come from the donations that we receive from our mm-hmm. gen- generous donors. So yeah, donate. You, you might need to join the advancement team. <laughs> you made a pretty compelling ask there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl, for everything you do here and for coming on Roger That today. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. That wraps up this episode of Roger That. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to Roger That on wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at HVAF of Indiana. And for even more stories on HVAF and the veterans that we serve, check out our blog on our website at HVAF.org. Thank you. And until no hero is homeless, We'll see you next time on Roger That, a podcast presented by HVAF of Indiana.